Welcome to the eLaborate Topics Podcast, where we focus on lab-specific strategies for medical laboratory professionals. We're proud to be the healthcare detectives that work behind the scenes to get the results needed to influence medical decisions. Let's grow together and jump right into the lab. Welcome to another episode of Elaborate Topics. Elaborate Topics is a weekly podcast where myself and my co-hosts, Stephanie Whitehead and Taiwana Wilson, come to you and bring you information and great tips regarding lab medicine and for clinical lab professionals to excel both inside and outside the lab. And today we have a special guest, Dr. Nadia Ayala Lopez, who is very passionate about growth of clinical lab professionals. And we're going to talk about opportunities for growth for clinical lab professionals. So let me tell you a little about, about Dr. Dr. Alaya Lopez. She is a clinical chemistry fellow at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. She received a Bachelor of Science in Clinical Lab Science from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and earned her PhD in Pharmacology and Toxicology from Michigan State University and completed a postdoctoral research fellowship in laboratory medicine at Yale University. Dr. Ayala Lopez has been a leader of professional development initiatives and training programs over the last six years for graduate students, researchers, and professionals at Michigan State University and Yale University. Welcome, Dr. Ayala Lopez. Thanks for taking the time to share your knowledge with us today. Thank you, Lona. I am very excited to be here to talk to you and your listeners about my passion, and that is laboratory medical professionals. All right, great, and we're excited to have you. I know in our podcast we do a lot of um, episodes on opportunities for lab professionals, on career development, and different. And I think today's topic is really going to cover a wide area of um, and answer a lot of questions on different opportunities and career development for clinical lab professionals. So I'm going to go right in and um, you know ask you a few questions. Before, the, like, the first question I'd want to ask you is just tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and a little bit about your journey towards, which I think you're moving towards um, a clinical lab director, so you're a little bit about your journey. Sure, I'd be happy to. Well, originally, um, I was born in Mexico City, and I moved to the United States with my family at three years old. Um, Early on, I was very interested in science, but all you really are exposed to as a young child are the doctors on TV. Um, So naturally, I decided I wanted to be a doctor because the treatment of diseases, that really excited me. It wasn't Mm -hmm. until my college years where I started to to question that and say, well, are there other things that I can do um, that are closer to the science aspect that I really loved? Well, I was pre-med and not, not exactly being fulfilled in my classes because I was one of maybe 200 students in a big lecture hall um, taking, my, taking my required classes, and it wasn't really what I had in mind for my journey in education. So I went to my counselor um, and, and spoke to her about this program that I saw in my catalog. Uh, so this is back when you had a 
big huge book that you had to lug around and look at all the classes that you needed. Mm -hmm. And so I showed her the page on clinical laboratory sciences and they wanted more information because I thought it was very interesting. One, you can do, um, you can be a champion of medical and patient care. And two, I was able to do the science that I really loved, so all the laboratory science that I was enjoying in my classes I would be able to apply on a daily basis. That's what I saw in the degree. But mm -hmm. I was dissuaded from my counselor. Um, she said, well, this is a really new program, and you should really just stay on your, your path. I, I don't think you'll, you'll like that. Um, she didn't really give me any reasons, but I thought that was, uh, that was strange. Um, and so I left, and I stuck it out in my biology degree for another semester. But it was still... Um, tugging at me, the, this opportunity to be a clinical lab scientist, a job I really didn't know that much about. So I went back to her and I said, no, you know, I really want to explore this program. So she sent me to the Allied Health Department and that's when I met um, Dr. Janice conway Clausen. So she was the program director of the clinical laboratory science, there, science program there at my university, at University of Nevada, Las Vegas. And she just, she was in her office, open door, and when I walked in, she just lit up, and I want to almost say it was like love at first sight. I knew that that's where I wanted to be. Um, she was very welcoming. She gave me the experience that I was wanting for in education, that, um, that experience of challenging yourself, of wanting to do better, of uh, being very passionate in what you're learning, and that's exactly what I I felt in the, in the program. It was an excellent program in clinical lab science. And one thing that was disappointing, though, is that the program was closed um, two semesters after I graduated due wow. to budget cuts. Yeah. Wow. Um, this is after lobbying the state to keep the program open because we were in a dire shortage of medical laboratory professionals and they were already threatening to close the program to save money um, due to budget cuts. So yeah, it was, it was very disappointing um, mm. knowing that this degree gave me the financial freedom of being able to find a job right after college and a very fulfilling job. And it really picked me up out of a uh, out of a bad place where I was, where I was questioning my education and, you know, what am I doing? And as a college student, you're, you're questioning everything anyways. Uh, and I felt that the clinical laboratory program not only gave me um, a place to, to be and grow as a scientist and as a professional, but many, many other students. So I had discussions with uh, Dr. Janice conway Clausen about what I wanted to do in my future, and I told her I was I was uh, pre-med, and she said, oh, you, you should try doing some research. And she gave me the opportunity to do research in the clinical laboratory science program core lab. So they had a little core mm -hmm. lab where they um, helped other researchers do clinical lab science analyses. Uh, so that's when I met Dr. Deborah Kyle, another one of my mentors who ran that lab, and she was a lab director. And that's also where I decided I wanted to be a lab director because she had both the best of both worlds. So she was a instructor in our program, and she was a researcher in the core lab. Um, she did some toxicology research, and she also directed that core lab, but also clinical labs in Las Vegas in the, in the city that we were in. Uh, so, I mean, I couldn't even have thought of a better job where you have – all those opportunities to do many things at once and be useful, have mm -hmm. skills where you can apply them and give people results either for the research or for patient care. Wow. Yeah, so in discussions with her, um, you know, she suggested that if she were to do it all over again, she would do a clinical chemistry fellowship. And to do that, um, I would have to get a PhD, so that's what I did. So I went to Michigan State University um, after I had been a technologist, uh, a medical lab scientist for two years, I went and got my PhD at Michigan State in pharmacology and toxicology. And that's where I met another one of my amazing mentors, um, St uh, Dr. Stephanie Watts. 
going into my PhD, I had this also kind of going into college where you have this expectation of what your education is going to be like. I had envisioned my advisor being a, um, a, a maybe an old white man with long hair, kind of like an Einstein that is in the basement and just really passionate about the science and just yells at you to get more results and um, yells at you to work harder. Like I thought that's what grad school is going to be like because I was basing it on the books that I had read. One of my favorite books is Aerosmith by Sinclair Lewis. Mm. Um, <laughs> and, and that's who I – I, I had thought uh, I was going to work under, well, when I went to the, the presentations where all the PIs were presenting, um, here walks in this, um, I don't think she's even five foot, um, woman who just started talking and blew me away. Um, she started talking about her passion for cardiovascular research, uh, for science, and to tell you the truth, I didn't even care what what her research was in, I said, you know what, I want to be in her lab. Um, the way she talked about her students and about how she supported all of the success of her students and her family. She talked about her family um, mm -hmm. and her, about her experiences of being a woman in science. I found that very inspiring, and I, I joined her lab. And with her, I had an amazing experience where we just tackled really difficult scientific questions. One thing I learned from her is that creativity is found everywhere. So mm -hmm. while other uh, investigators were hiring postdocs and really experienced scientists to lead the research, mm -hmm. Dr. Watts mostly hires undergraduates and mm -hmm. high school volunteers. Mm -hmm. And she would give them the opportunity. They, they would get paid, and she would – have them design their own experiments. They weren't there to wash dishes. Her, her expectation was that you're going to contribute because you have mm -hmm. something to contribute. You have a brain and you have an amazing brain. Mm -hmm. um, so with her, it was, uh, I think I, I learned more about myself um, in that experience um, because I had already formed that, fo that scientific foundation as a clinical laboratory scientist. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that really was key. So after you know, leaving um, my PhD, I went on to do a laboratory medicine fellowship and research because one thing that I realized is that in order to move the laboratory medicine field further, we need, we need to get out there. We need to publish. We need to show people that we're solving problems, that we have all this data uh, that we collect in the laboratory, and that it is valuable. Mm -hmm. And I did that. And so I did uh, various research projects where I collected data from the electronic health record to either establish new reference intervals for different analytes using tens of thousands of patient results. Um, mm -hmm. We also did a study in looking at test utility of procalcitonin in the, real, in the real world diagnosing of pneumonia. So what do we actually, how are we actually using these results? Uh, those are the questions that I became very interested in. And through that experience at Yale, um, through that, I also was very active in the profession, in professional development of uh, staff, of students, uh, because I wanted to share and pay it forward to all of these great mentors that I had that could, believed in me. Uh, mm -hmm. I always felt the need to, to support and bring other people up uh, because I owe so much to my team of mentors. You always have to have it team that will drive you further. Mm -hmm. So I want to be part of other people's team. Wow. Yeah, and, and I guess that, that brings me to today where I'm a clinical chemistry fellow at Johns Hopkins. This is a two-year fellowship that will, that will help me get certified to be a lab director. Um, so this, the uh, CMS requires a certification for lab directorship, and that requires experience, um, board exam, and, um, and one way to get that experience is through this, uh, this two-year fellowship. So things that I do as a fellow are um, very interesting. I'm very much liking the journey. It's not just about the destination because the journey for me is every day I get to help clinicians 
when they have questions about their patient's lab results, or maybe they want they don't they don't know what test to order, and I'm the person that they can email that they can call to help guide them. Uh, one of my most asked questions, for example, is you know is my patient taking is my patient taking drugs, or what are my drugs? My, what is my what drugs am I, is my patient taking, or is my patient taking the right drugs, or are they taking them on time, or are they taking enough? Uh, mm -hmm. So, only laboratorians really have the answers to those questions. So, mm -hmm. uh, our ability to connect with the clinicians and give them that support and those resources is mm -hmm. um, something I'm really cherishing, and I'm grateful to have that opportunity right now. Wow. Wow. Wow, Nadia. Wow. Your picture, your journey, I mean, it, it's almost like I could just, like, I'm actually reading a story, and it, <laughs> what I saw so profound was the fact that you knew where you wanted to go. And mm -hmm. it was so important, and, and having that mentor that helped you and maybe just watching someone to see that this, I'd want to be this person one day, and knowing that early and being able to craft that, um, that map to get there, like, you know, it's like a journey map and doing all the, the things that you did and just talking about the story, paint a really clear picture of what clinical lab professionals do and, you know, the things that we offer. And even for you at the different stages, what you offered to the professional, uh, to the profession is so profound. And even at this point with answering the questions from providers, being able to um, say, well, yes, your patient is taking this drug. Are they taking it, how, the frequency, whether it's um, drugs that are actually um, prescribed to them or drugs that mm -hmm. were not prescribed, and answering, the quest, answering those questions from providers, it's just, I mean, your journey is really an amazing journey and a very, you know, it's like a very – I can actually picture all the different steps in your journey. Amazing. Yeah, I think that the, this field has become so complex that it's mm -hmm. not just um, it's just, it's not just one person that can can help with the with these inquiries because we have thousands of tests that can mm -hmm. be ordered for every different situation. So mm -hmm. laboratorians are really key, not just for running the tests, but for mm -hmm. providing that, um, you know, as Dr. Watts, my, my PI would say, like, we, we have a really good brain. So, you know, we, we mm -hmm. should be expected. And, um, and our, our value is not just of performing the test, but being mm -hmm. that intellectual resource, because medical mm -hmm. lab professionals have real foundational training that provides all of that knowledge. Right, right. Yeah, that's so important for us to see and, um, you know, knowing that there's just so much opportunity in the profession for people once they actually explore these um, opportunities, and that's what we're going to talk about today. And I like the, uh, when you said that um, your mentor had high school students and um, people at different levels contributing. And when people know that they have it within themselves to do instead of um, not knowing that it's there for them to, like I would say, un unleash or unearth their potential and, and use it at the highest level. And hopefully after today's conversation, we will inspire lab professionals to know that there's just so much, so much opportunity and so much that they can do. Mm -hmm. So um, my next question is, um, why do you think that career development for clinical lab professionals in a, is an important topic at this time? That's a really good question. I think that it's important because it's a career in lab medicine is very special. 
Mm-hmm. And career life medicine, uh, th- this is appropriate for this week. Um, really, it's focused down to gratitude because the skills that we've learned in our training in medical lab science, they are foundational. We need mm-hmm. to accept this and trust mm-hmm. it and don't mm-hmm. take it for granted. And with anything mm-hmm. that we don't want to lose, we have to use and we have to exercise mm-hmm. it. We have to protect it and we have to mm-hmm. grow it. Mm-hmm. So I think that's just in a, in a personal, for personal reason, that's, that's mm-hmm. why it's so important this time because we are valuable as medical professionals mm-hmm. and as people. So we mm-hmm. owe it to ourselves and to the responsibility to our patients to mm-hmm. develop our career, to exercise our skills, to go deeper in our technical competencies, um, to go deeper in outreach and sharing to the world and what a medical laboratory scientist or professional is. Mm-hmm. So that's the, the, the personal reasons. The other reasons are that we are very essential to, to the world too. Um, we mm-hmm. recognize, especially in this time and even before this, that um, people rely on the laboratory's results in mm-hmm. order to move forward in their lives. So they may be waiting for the results of a biopsy um, to, to make a life decision, to emotionally be able to move forward in their life. These are very important things that impact people's lives. And right now, with a current pandemic, we are on the news all the time, um, not, necessarily, not necessarily us, but t- lab testing is. Mm-hmm. Um, and why that's critical is because who's going to do it if we, do, we have so many laboratory professionals that may see a future outside of the lab? They mm-hmm. perhaps leave. We've, see, we've all seen amazing colleagues leave because for whatever reason, um, they don't see a future for themselves in the lab anymore, and they leave to mm-hmm. another profession. And so we are losing a lot of very talented people that have this foundational knowledge, mm-hmm. and we're losing them to, to other jobs. Um, and while that's, that's great for them, definitely, if they're, if they're happy in that job, um, but it definitely is a loss for the for, for the profession, um, losing all those people with, as we talked about, with very valuable uh, abilities to contribute. Wow. Well, yep. You know, I, I, you know, especially now, I think you have different um, people retiring. You have just so much, and you're saying that foundational um, knowledge is so important to have now in the lab and we can't mm-hmm. afford to either, I suppose. So when I think I'm thinking about is turnover, do we have a challenge with turnover or is it more about you have the, the, the older people who are moving on, retiring and not having replacement? Is it a big challenge for clinical lab professional on a whole when it comes to turnover? I think it is, um, but it's not necessarily a numbers game. So when you compare the turnover in the laboratory to other fields, it's, 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 it's not as bad as other fields. So our laboratory turnover is in from a nationwide survey is about 16%. If you compare that to health care, people in healthcare or social assistance, which is about 30%, if you compare that to people that work in accommodations like hotels or food service, that's 70%. So when you think about it and compare to those numbers, you're like, well, okay, maybe we don't have a turnover problem. But then you actually d- drill down the numbers and you find that clinical lab professionals are very difficult to replace. So even though we don't have a lot of turnover per se, when someone leaves, they're leaving with many, many years of experience on maybe running some assays. And if you lose them, you may not be able to run a certain test, or you may lose some, some procedure, you may lose um, that institutional knowledge. So lab professionals are extremely valuable and losing them um, really affects operations and affects morale. Uh, People are already overworked. Um, They don't have 
those, uh, those staff resources. Um, I know that it's always a challenge trying to get everybody's vacation because a lot of the times there, there is nobody to cover for them. So mm -hmm. it, is a, it is a problem, not necessarily a numbers problem when you compare it to other people, other, other um, areas of, of health care. But when you see the effect, it has a huge impact. Uh, one of the things that concerns me too is there are, re there are retirements, and that is expected as we have an aging workforce because we don't have enough training programs that are graduating uh, clinical lab professionals. But the other issue is that we are not retaining those clinical lab professionals that come in. So when you see young people, they may stay in the lab a couple years, and then they move on um, to maybe uh, another degree or they, they, they get another job that's outside of the lab. And we really need to think about, you know, why that is. Because ethically, can I continue to, re to try to – uh, recruit and set up training programs and get people into the field if I can't give them assurance that they will see a future for themselves remaining in this field for the next two, five years? You know, mm -hmm. Could I keep doing that? Can I say, hey, you come to this field where it's going to be great. You, you, know, you can stay here for um, however long you want. You can develop your career. You can uh, really grow with the lab. Mm -hmm. If that is not what's happening, you know, we can't. We we really do need to face this issue of um, making sure that we have places for all of these talented, valuable people to stay within the lab, to see a future for themselves, to see them have the impact that they wanted to to have when they signed up mm -hmm. for the job. People are right. signing up for being a lab professional because they want to help people. So mm -hmm. if they're leaving, it's. We, we need to listen to that. We need to understand it, and we need to do mm -hmm. something about it. Right. That, that's a really, really good point. And um, hopefully this podcast elaborate topic will help with some of that. And I think just today's topic with you, um, Nadia, hopefully we'll be able to clarify some of the opportunities that are out there and I'm hoping that that can be utilized in each of the labs where people can see because I was at that point where I didn't know what was my next step. I was like, I want to stay in the lab. I'm looking for opportunities to stay, but I wasn't clear about the next step. But before we go into um, opportunities, you know, there's this, saying in the clinical lab community that we are heroes behind the scenes. Um, so what suggestions would you give to clinical lab professionals regarding like community and outreach programs? And how do you think that would help their career development? This is so important. I think that seeing yourself as a laboratory professional gives you the power to make sure that you are sharing those experiences outside of the lab. So you're not just coming into work, clocking in, doing your job, and then leaving that identity to go and do something else. When I think about myself as an identity, I do think of myself as a medical laboratory scientist in my identity, and I like to share mm -hmm. that with other people mm -hmm. because that's unique to me. Um, mm -hmm. And so going out into the community, um, talking to your, your kids' teachers uh, about zooming into their classroom to share with them what it is to work in a medical lab is going to do so many things. One, it's going to open up their world to understanding what lab professionals do because actually doing what we do is really cool. Um, and I think that it's easy to sell that to a, a child. So, well, we get mm -hmm. to look at a microscope. We get to help doctors make diagnoses. And mm -hmm. a lot of the times they, they, don't, they, don't, know about, they don't know about us. Um, so they're mm -hmm. really missing out. So I think sharing that with them is a really fun experience. Um, mm -hmm. And then on the other end, when we go out into the community, we, if we work on um, – Using our identity, we contribute to community projects and outreach that also 
helps us understand what our role in the community is. So as medical lab scientists, are we actually serving the community that we're supposed to be serving? Um, it's important to go out there and speak to uh, speaking to your neighbors. What are, their, what are their needs? What are they thinking about? To make sure that as medical laboratory professionals, we have an understanding and that we can be a voice for them when it comes time to be that voice for them. Um, when you're making a decision in the hospital environment and you need to think about maybe um, healthcare equity, Mm -hmm. That is where it helps in your career development, uh, and that's where it has helped me. I'm active in a really nice program called Letters to a Pre-Scientist, where I'm a pen pal to a fifth grader, mm -hmm. and I've been doing mm -hmm. this for many years. <laughs> wow. And they are um, they're really great kids. They are from underserved communities, mm -hmm. and, boy, they have, te they have taught me a lot. Wow. Um, they have taught me that I take uh, that that I've taken certain things for granted, um, that I can um, that just my value in sharing with a, a child what what I do can really make a difference. So sometimes you think, mm -hmm. oh, you know, what can I what, what what impact can I have? But just taking a few minutes to mm -hmm. impact a child in the community, impact your neighbors. Um, it really gives you gratitude for mm -hmm. being alive, for having this education, for having this foundational knowledge of being a lab professional. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I'm going to ask you for um, information on, um, on the letters to the pre-scientist, and I'll mm -hmm. share it in our podcast notes. Hopefully, um, if anybody would be interested um, yes. Yeah, and there are lots of similar programs like that for interacting with with um, with either kids or undergraduates that are mm -hmm. looking into STEM field uh, jobs. So there's a lot mm -hmm. of support for STEM fields, and as medical laboratory professionals, we we fit with within that. Um, definitely, there's science. We're scientists. We're engineers. We're, we're mathematicians. <laughs> we mm -hmm. do it all. Right, right. Wow. Awesome, awesome. Um, so, and I know also the um, getting involved in associations is a big deal. Last, our last yeah. um, podcast, there were two um, guests on um, getting involved in our professional association. So, you know, that's great. Hopefully our listeners will um, listen to that also. So um, a little bit more detail in, you know, how lab professionals could look at opportunities. So for um, people who are looking for the next level in their career, clinical lab career, what options do they have for career opportunities? Because I know people ask a lot of questions like, What's there after I'm done, you know, as a bench tech, I don't know what next to do. And sometimes yeah. people leave the profession. So what options yeah. are there? Yeah, I think that one of, the, one of the things that I love about the laboratory field is that there are many, there are many types of labs to work in. And even if you, know, you are in a lab, that uh, maybe it, it's not the ideal place for you or you don't see a future for yourself there, um, there are many other opportunities because there are many different sides of labs. So mm -hmm. you may um, enjoy a smaller lab, maybe more uh, a lab that serves a small clinic, and those jobs will use different skills. So you may be drawing patients as well as running lab testing, as well as fulfilling some of the managerial duties. Um, mm -hmm. And that may be very stimulating to, to someone that wants to be able to do multiple things at once. So I would say mm -hmm. think about the different sides of, your, of the job that you already have. Go, how are mm -hmm. other people in your same job doing it differently in other places? So if you go mm -hmm. to a hospital lab, what is your day like going to be there. Um, it's definitely going to be very different. You're 
probably only either going to be drawing patients or running the testing. Um, and their roles will be different too because you might have multiple different levels of management and different complexity mm -hmm. of management. Uh, mm -hmm. In a larger hospital, there may be opportunities or in a, like a, a larger uh, reference lab to be more involved in specialized roles, such as point-of-care testing. Um, mm -hmm. There's people that go into being a point-of-care point coordinator, and that involves going to lots of different places, interacting with lots of different um, types of services in a hospital or in a, a hospital system that are using mm -hmm. point-of-care tests. So I would say mm -hmm. the, the, that job is definitely for people, people that love to communicate and teach. Um, in other, uh, other opportunities that a laboratory professional would enjoy may be um, going into safety or quality assurance um, or quality control. So all these things that technologists um, or medical laboratory scientists do on a day-to-day -day basis, there has to be someone to coordinate all these things, um, especially as your laboratory gets larger and more complex. So if, that, if, a certain, um, if a certain area of what you do calls to you, whether it be safety or putting together competency lists or putting together protocols, there's probably a, a job where that is the focus. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm going to go to what's really high in demand right now, and that is people with technical skills that um, can help with setting up laboratory information systems. There are lots of opportunities for medical laboratory professionals to help on the computer end because it's, it's easier to train someone that knows the medical lab, the computer stuff, versus the other way around. So you can't take um, you know, a, a software developer and teach them medical laboratory stuff in a month, right? It, it's impossible. But if you take somebody with medical laboratory skills that already knows the terminology, the knowledge, the workflows, uh, they are very valuable with helping um, set up the informatics, uh, set up the electronic health record, all the things that we uh, realize that we've been taking for granted because we interact with them at our work, but there's someone that has to very thoughtfully build all of these tools. And medical lab professionals are very in, in high demand in those areas. Wow. Okay, sounds like a lot of different things that um, opportunities. So in terms of like opportunities where they may need additional degrees or certification? What, mm -hmm. what other opportunities are there for, for that? Well, I found um, you know, my path uh, exciting for me because I was interested in research. So mm -hmm. my path involved um, getting a, a graduate degree as a PhD level in order to be able to sit for the um, like the clinical director board exam, so that is there. And there are multiple fellowships for PhDs for that. It's not just in clinical chemistry. There's also in microbiology, um, genetics, and cytogenetics, and molecular genetics. Um, so you can go that route um, and be a clinical laboratory director. That is more on the technical end because there's also administrative directors. There's kind of both in parallel, we have the um, administration side and also the, mm -hmm. the technical, uh, the more patient care side. Mm -hmm. So I'm more on the technical, more patient care side. On the administration side, that may be um, getting you know, uh, degrees in public health or HR uh, or an MBA um, to help you lead those labs in the operations part of it. So there's lots mm -hmm. of uh, different workflows and lots of things to learn on the operations of a lab because we are a uh, we are a clinical service, but we're also a factory. You know, we have automation, we have moving parts, we have um, turnaround times, we have deadlines, we have things that we have to deliver. Um, mm -hmm. 
So an advanced degree in order to manage all of those and be knowledgeable in the operations and how to manage a business is useful for those higher up leadership positions in administration in the lab. Others, um, positions that would require graduate degrees, there is a very interesting degree now called the Doctor of Clinical Lab Science. And that is a new degree, but that is um, a doctorate level clinical laboratory scientist, someone that also interacts with providers, acts as a resource in the hospital for providers to interact with the lab. Mm -hmm. And they, this is going to be a growing field, and I'm very excited to see you know, where the doctors of clinical laboratory scientists are going to take us because mm -hmm. as the laboratory gets more and more complex, we are no longer the lab. We're no longer a room in the basement. Mm -hmm. We're a department. We right. are, um, we're, not just a, we, we, we're not just giving a service of, okay, you give us a tube and then we give you a number. <laughs> you know, we don't do that. Um, we, we, we don't just give information. Um, we give the context of the information. We give interpretation, and that's what the doctor of clinical lab scientists helps uh, with. So they are going to be extremely valuable uh, and extremely in demand um, in the future of healthcare and integration of the laboratory uh, with healthcare. So I think those are the, the main avenues that I'd want to highlight. Yeah, great, great. Um, thank you so much because I know we get a lot of questions. Um, sometimes I get direct message as to what should I do next. And so um, I think this podcast is going to be valuable to a lot of people and just you outlining the different opportunities and, you know, the, some of them you may need a graduate degree, some you may not, you may need certification for some areas. So thank you mm -hmm. so much for that. Um, I know we're getting close to the end, but I want to ask this question, and, you know, I don't know, you know, if there was, is a way to, you know, kind of guide us through this um, in a fairly quick way. Um, this question is basically about the path. So for clinical um, professionals who want to develop themselves and they're unsure about steps, like mm -hmm. path that they need to take, how would you guide them? The main thing is <clears throat> to find your mentors. Uh, definitely talk to people that are in a job that you're interested in or a job that you don't really know that much about in the lab and have them share with you what, what a day in their life is like. So I think talking and exploring are the most important, um, that's the most important step you can take uh, because that is how you're collecting data. You're collecting data to see if this is going to be the right path for you. Um, so once you've done that, I think that having a systematic approach where you're not Trying to do it all at once is very important. Um, so setting up a plan for yourself um, that you can review every month or every few months to make sure that you're on track. So set goals for yourself. And I like to talk about you know, setting SMART goals because these are goals that are specific to the S, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. So as you're going through exploring jobs, making your plan for, okay, I'm, today I'm going to talk to, you might say a plan, I'm going to talk to one person about their job, and that would be your, your SMART goal. You're going to talk to one person today and learn about their job. And as you go through, you can keep setting SMART goals. So your next one might be, well, I really like um, what I heard about this job in, in regulatory affairs. Well, then your next SMART goal might be find out what you need to do to move forward in that path or attain a certain certification within the next year that will help me on that path. So writing this out helps you put it all into a page outside of your brain, so you don't have to worry about it. And you can just look and look at your plan, see where you are, and see where you've mm -hmm. been. 
That way you can continue and feel like you are moving forward. Uh, you don't ever want to just take it all at once and think that you have to accomplish it all in one day. Because mm -hmm. one thing I learned is that there are no shortcuts. If you try to take a shortcut, you will pay for it later. So just take it slow, um, take it step by step, talk to people, and definitely get their support. Because you never know, there's something they might tell you when you talk to them that you might remember five years later that might be crucial and might be the key to your success later. Uh, so those are the fun surprises that you will open yourself up to when you talk, go out and, and talk to people about their jobs and find mentors. Um, thank you so much. Um, well, you mentioned mentors, and I know that throughout you've been mentoring mentors. Um, so how did mentor help you in your career development? Mentors have been completely a key um, to my development. And there's also, you know, nowadays there's discussion about mentors versus sponsors and versus coaches. So I'm not really going to go into all the discussion between that, but there's definitely different flavors to mentors, um, different styles that they will guide you in. And what has helped me, uh, why they have been key is because they have been in my corner. So they were wanting the best for me. Um, I think that that was important not just because they gave me guidance, but just knowing that someone was there and someone believed in me helped me believe in myself when I was unsure. One of my earliest mentors, Dr. Jan Conway Cawson, she has um, – she has children that went to the same high school as me. And they also experienced some of the same challenges that I did. And when I spoke to her, we had that shared lived experience of she knew how I grew up, what kind of challenges that I had, and she could look at me and honestly tell me and give me feedback, knowing that she knew who I was I can trust, I, I was able to trust her feedback. It wasn't that she was just, you know, patting me on the back, like, oh, good job. No, mm -hmm. she, she challenged me, and she's like, I know you can do this. Um, she told me, you know, I know you're a good person. And I think about that all the time. Um, when I'm ever doubting myself, I think about the times where my mentors have told me positive things about myself, uh, not because they were trying to make me feel better, but because they actually knew me. So being a mentee is a, also a two-way street. You have to mm -hmm. share with your mentors. You have to be mm -hmm. vulnerable with them. Um, you have to listen and be willing to take their punches if they throw them. And Stephanie, <laughs> um, my PhD advisor, literally would throw punches at me because we used to exercise <laughs> by mm -hmm. doing Krav Maga. And so she took me and, and, and wow, that, that was an experience. But um, you have to be willing to put yourself out there and, and, and take a beating and know that it's from, from love. And you, that has helped me be there for my mentees as well, is to make sure that they know that they're completely supported, that I see all the positive things in them, that I see their best intentions even when they make mistakes because I've made so many mm -hmm. mistakes with my mentors and they were still there for me they didn't um yeah as you're growing up you might say the wrong thing or you know not meet a deadline and they were forgiving uh, mm -hmm. so that all I think has been key in my development in my career um and development as a mentor um, so, uh, like I said, I owe everything to my team of mentors, and I think everybody should and deserves to have their own team uh, of mentors w with them as well. Wow, great, great advice and the whole idea that they were not afraid to challenge you, and even when you made the mistakes, they didn't just hold that against you, but they still continue to challenge and support you. That was that's great. Yeah. Um, yeah. We mentioned that mentioned mentors a lot in this program because uh, we feel that it's really important, and which is separate, as we say, from coaching. And you know. So yes, we're 
at, there's just so much that we could talk about. It's really a yeah. fun topic and just a valuable topic. Um, but we um, are almost get, we're getting there. So what's next for you personally and professionally? Well, personally and professionally, so I'm getting – almost ready to wrap up my fellowships. I have one year left on this clinical chemistry fellowship. Right now I'm very much enjoying the journey of having that direct daily impact. And I'm going to move into a different position um, where I will be a lab director. So currently I'm doing the, the job search dance um, of looking for my next step, um, which would be a position as a, a laboratory director. So. Personally, I look forward to kind of changing and reinventing myself on a new chapter of my life, which will be to you know, finish out this position. I'll move to a new location, meet all new different, different people, um, a new lab, and that is always very exciting. So stay tuned. Um, hopefully, you know, one year from now, I'll, I'll know where I have landed and um, well, I will keep in touch with Lona and I will keep listening to the podcast. Awesome, awesome. So how could the listeners um, um, support you in any way? Is there, are you on LinkedIn or any social media? Um, what, it, could they follow you or support you in any way? Yes, um, I, you can find me on LinkedIn as Nadia Ayala Lopez, and I'm also on Twitter as Dr. Ayala Lopez. Um, so feel free to follow me, interact with me. I'd love to hear uh, your experience your audience's experiences and thoughts um, to, to just interact with them more. So I'd, I'd love to hear from you guys. Thank you so much. Um, definitely, we don't get a lot of people who are so passionate about building up our clinical lab professionals and, you know, giving them ideas and tips uh, in which they can succeed. So thank you so much for this. And thank you, listeners, for listening to Elaborate Topics podcast. Um, you can listen to this episode and other episodes, previous episodes, on your favorite um, podcast platform. So if you want to um, get in touch with us, there's an email, Elaborate Topics at Direct Impact Broadcasting. And even for this episode, you can just go on to Direct Impact broadcasting.com to um, listen to this episode. So thank you so much, and you have an awesome day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Elaborate Topics where your hosts discussed relevant strategies for laboratory professionals. Please subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform and listen to us on directimpactbroadcasting.com. Stay tuned for another episode with information you can use to excel in your laboratory career.